Welcome to your second favorite part of the week, and that is developmental psychology. It could be the first or your favorite part of the week, I guess, if you like chapter seven more. But we get a double dip this week, and so we're covering not only chapter seven, but chapter eight. So let's jump into it. Beginning with the reconstructive nature of memory. When remembering, we actively reconstruct memories, not passively downloading exact copy off the internet, reproduce them. Patching together our often fuzzy recollections with our best hunches about what really happened. So the idea that um, memories and kind of the brain works in this uh, AI um, kind of you know traditional upload download style, wherein you know we upload an exact memory and then we download that exact memory, which uh, retains more or less uh, consistency uh, throughout our lives is incorrect. Uh, rather, uh, we're constantly reconstructing our memories um, and reproducing them. And thus, we kind of have a set of fuzzy recollections of things and then kind of piecing together uh, what it is that actually happened uh, to fill in the blanks of our memories. When you, re when you remember yourself taking a walk, you see yourself as an observer would. Interestingly, Chinese uh, uh, individuals are more likely than white Americans to see themselves at a distance in such memories. This result uh, fits with findings that members of many Asian cultures are more likely than members of Western cultures to adopt others' perspectives. So kind of just like an interesting uh, cross-cultural study, uh, when you ask to, again, to uh, remember yourself taking a walk, to, um, uh, many Americans uh, are more likely to see themselves uh, um, kind of zoomed in, like the image to your left. Uh, while Chinese or uh, individuals or kind of um, collectivist cultures, moreover, um, are more likely to uh, imagine themselves kind of in a uh, in a larger uh, scene with many back with much background information or relatively more background information compared to Americans within this study, and that's kind of consistent with uh, previous literature and other types of uh, reconstruction uh, memory uh, task, as well as uh, asking uh, Asian in individuals to uh, draw certain uh, portraits. Um, if you remember from previous material and other chapters. Next, we're going to talk about the information processing approach of memory. This approach emphasizes the basic mental processes involved in attention, perception, memory, and decision making. The maturation of the nervous system plus experience enables adults to remember more than young children. Now, let's go into a little more detail about what uh, uh, parts of memory that the information approach, a processing approach, uh, deals with. Specifically, I want to look at kind of three um, aspects of memory, or um, types of memory, rather, um, that's kind of traditionally uh, taught, and these are kind of like the broad um, overviews of these uh, three uh, subcategories of, of memory. The first is sensory register, brief storage of per perceptual information before it is passed to short-term memory. Each sense has its own form of sensory memory, with visual memory lasting only about one second, Auditory lasting about 5 to 10 seconds. Short-term memory, memory system that retains information for limited durations. Closely related to working memory, a brief in duration, 5 to 20 seconds. Long-term memory, de believed to be relatively permanent and seemingly unlimited uh, store of information. So kind of the differences here, as I stated, we have sensory memory, which is kind of straightforward. You have five senses um, in each of the uh, subcomponents. Uh, uh, the sensory components of memory, uh, really dealing with just a very brief uh, store of, of perceptual information uh, before it's passed on to the short-term memory. And the short-term memory is a little longer, um, but it's also very brief, um, lasting, you know, it's our, uh, at maximum in you know, around 20 seconds, but, you know, the range uh, uh, differs um, depending on the type of information being stored, and uh, sci and uh, scientists argue about you know the extent uh, of or the duration of, sh of short-term memory. But this is kind of an easy heuristic. And then long-term memory, pretty straightforward. It's long, and scientists uh, uh, suspect that it's an unlimited uh, amount of uh, information that you can store in long-term memory. Let's talk about uh, steps to uh, remembering something. And beginning with encoding, to encode material, we must first attend to it. 
Most events we experience are never encoded in the first place. Attention's role in memory. Next in line effect. Teacher asks you to tell me a fun fact about you. Don't pay attention to the person in front of you. Memory for common objects are never coded. So kind of a couple key takeaway points here is that in order to encode a memory, uh, you have to pay attention to it. And the most common things that we don't uh, pay attention to are things that we commonly encounter. So for example, uh, which of these pennies is real? Uh, many uh, students are unable to do so, and in, in, any individuals, I should say, are unable to do so because it's so common that there's really no reason to interact, um, or sorry, to encode um, and interact with this uh, penny in such a way that it allows for encoding of memory. And just kind of one uh, example is the, uh, another example is the next in line effect. Um, and this speaks again to kind of the intention that is required to encode a memory. So you can imagine everybody's been in that circumstance where the teacher's like, okay, you're gonna, we're gonna go around the room and tell us your little bio or your hobbies or whatever. And then everybody's rapidly thinking, oh shit, do I have any hobbies? Oh shit, oh shit. And you're just thinking about it over and over again. Um, if I were to ask an individual who's you know, hyper uh, focused on trying to figure out you know, what the hell my hobbies are, uh, what it is that they, uh, you know, two or three students uh, said their hobbies were in front of them, they're far less likely uh, to remember that because um, they're not paying attention to it. <laughs> uh, it just speaks to the uh, role of attention in uh, encoding memories. Next, consolidation and storage. Stability and uh, organize information uh, to facilitate long-term memory or storage, I should say. Facilitated by sleep, disrupted by stress, assistance when we relate new material with prior knowledge, storage, process of keeping information in memory, constructive process, not a static recording like a video recording. So kind of the idea here is that, or kind of a couple of takeaways is that uh, consolidation uh, re is interrupted and uh, as well storage uh, to a lack of sleep, uh, which we've talked about in this class and um, we'll briefly talk about here is this uh, sleep uh, interrupting REM sleep, uh, REM uh, cycles of sleep, which are implicated in, um, in at least in animal models in long-term uh, in memory storage of, of really memory overall, uh, and there's evidence for this in uh, human studies as well. Um, and the consolidation of memories are assisted when we relate new material with prior knowledge. So if I already have kind of a uh, a working understanding of a particular concept or a particular subject, and then I relate the, my new, this new information that I'm learning to that previously learned information, it's more likely to kind of stick in our memory. And like I said before, uh, memory is not this AI upload-download process, but rather a constructive process um, that requires a reconstruction, reconstructing memory over time. Moving on to other uh, types of memory. Now I, I put retrieval here um, in this slide because it really right, uh, relates to the uh, following two bullet points. So although it's kind of the pro uh, part of the process of encoding, storage, and consolidation, and then retrieval, um, I, it really relates to um, the all the, uh, the rest of the materials within this slide. So to begin with retrieval, the process of getting information out when it is needed often doesn't match what we originally put into it. We have recognition memory, which is selecting previously remembered information from an array of options, uh, multiple choice, and recall memory, generating previously remembered information, requires active retrieval without the aid of uh, 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 cues. When did Florida become an American state? So we have two types of memory that we're looking at here. Recognition, as stated, uh, kind of an example would be multiple choice. You're looking at uh, multiple options, and you have the cues of kind of the context of options, right? Because you're limited to typically four options, sometimes five. But you know, you have a you know 25 to uh, you know approximately 25 to 20 percent chan uh, chance of selecting the correct answer. Well, recall memory uh, and typically um, discussed in a free recall memory kind of scenario, it um, involves not having any uh, cues at all. So I could just ask you a question, and obviously it's not multiple choice, it's you know, fill in the blank or an essay or, or just uh, you know, so, something along those lines. And an individual is required to just actively retrieve that information again without any cues. 
Continuing on in other types of memory, we have queued recall memory. So this is a recall memory, but this time I would give you a little hint. So, I mean, I could say, um, you know, what state or what year did Florida become a, a part of the United States? And then I can say, oh, it's, um, you know, whatever, it's in the uh, 19th century or something to kind of um, hone, help you hone in on the correct answer. Other types of uh, memory include a uh, working memory, which refers to our ability to hold onto information we're currently thinking about, attending to or processing actively, generally referred to in, in, in the context of trying to achieve a goal. So the image on the right is actually from research that I co conducted in the Democratic Republic of Congo that uh, tested the working me memory um, skills of on this particular task of uh, young children on this working memory task. And they were specifically asked to place the yellow blocks as seen in the child's hand um, and the yellow bucket and the blue blocks in the blue bucket, which is uh, not seen on the screen, the blue blocks that is. Um, so again, this speaks to kind of uh, trying to achieve a goal in this case, trying to perform well on this task. Um, um, so yeah, so we, so we, so we see this uh, develop uh, throughout early childhood and I believe that, um, from my knowledge at least, that this was the first time that uh, children's uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo's working memory uh, was analyzed. And specifically, I was looking at the role of intergenerational stress on uh, children's working memory. Uh, that is the impact of lifelong stress on uh, their mothers um, and how that uh, is related to uh, working memory within their children. And, you know, spoiler, I found an association between those two um, uh, factors. Moving on to the central executive, directs attention and controls the flow of information. Phonological loop holds ad um, auditory information. The visual spatial sketchpad holds visual information. And the epi episodic buffer links auditory and visual um, uh, information. So this central executive is kind of acting as, well, kind of like an executive. They are um, actively directing attention towards uh, certain information and controlling the flow of information. And some researchers argue that with, uh, as adults age, the central executive kind of de uh, declines in uh, its ability to perform those two tasks and thus leading to poor, poor performance on um, particular uh, tasks, so such as a working memory task. And again, a central executive is not really exact, like, you know, the, this brain, uh, you know, there's something, the central executive brain, it's really a collection of brain regions uh, that are uh, attempting to um, direct attention and control the flow of information. So it's referred to, so this is kind of a conceptual uh, understanding of this particular network of neurological regions. Implicit and explicit memory. Implicit slash procedural memory occurs unintentionally, automatically, and without awareness, remains intact throughout life. Explicit memory slash declarative memory involves deliberate, effortful recollection of events. The, uh, there's two types of explicit memory that we're going to look at. Some, uh, semantic, which is um, general facts, how many states are there, for example. Or episodic, specific memory, where were uh, you during initial quarantine? So kind of the idea here is kind of straightforward, implicit, uh, kind of very similar to the word. It's that uh, this kind of memory is occurring unintentionally, automatic, without awareness, um, and you don't really have to pay you don't have to pay attention to it at all uh, to uh, learn this uh, information or remember it. First is kind of a much more again <laughs> effortful. Uh, I'm uh, allocating attention to it. I'm uh, deliberating on something that is explicit memory and again two facts with general facts so again how many uh, states there are for kind of a trivia question versus episodic where dealing really with more with you and um, uh, kind of dealing more with uh, spatial uh, components uh, and uh, dealing with uh, you know, just where you were dur during during that time. So it was kind of a general fact versus more of a person-specific, individualized, um, often specific memory uh, that involve that is that is uh, revolves around a particular individual. Let's talk about some memory issues. One, 
and kind of the most common one that's understood is amnesia. It's the most common, uh, the, the most common types of am, uh, amnesia are retrograde, which is the loss of past memory, retro, kind of an easy way to remember that. And enterograde is the loss of ability to make new memorize, uh, memories. Generalized uh, amnesia is very rare as it is, as is sudden recovery of memory. So we have kind of two types, one, the loss of memory uh, before whatever the event occurred, and um, uh, another type which involves uh, an inability to create and make new memories. Now let's look at a famous case study, H.M., whose hippocampus was removed from both sides of the brain to control seizures. Uh, he, he was experiencing or experienced mild retrograde and severe anterograde amnesia. Could not remember what he ate for dinner. Showed evidence of implicit memory. Did not remember practicing a mirror tracing test, but performance improved over time. Okay, so what are our big points here? One, this is a famous case study. And like most famous case studies in psychology, as I've reviewed in this class many times, um, they often have uh, reinterpretations of, of these seminal studies many years later. And now researchers believe, uh, after examining um, the brain of HM, uh, after the death of HM, uh, that the uh, hippocampus actually wasn't removed and it was um, regions of the brain that uh, primarily communicate with the hip hippocampus, thus leaving the hippocampus kind of isolated. So kind of the general idea though at first was, okay, so this hippocampus was removed and now we can see uh, if there are deficits um, and what deficits uh, occur um, neurologically. Um, in the absence of a hippocampus and then draw conclusions about the specializations of that brain region, specifically the hippocampus, um, by testing, you know, uh, making HM in this case, perform particular memory tasks and again, seeing uh, uh, what tests he performs well on, what tests he performs poorly on, and then drawing inferences based, uh, drawing inferences of the functionality of the hippocampus based on uh, those findings. So what do we have here? We have, ex he experienced mild retrograde uh, amnesia and severe enterograde amnesia. So kind of a, uh, a mild loss of previous memories, but a severe loss of uh, an ability to create new memories. So we cannot remember um, what he ate for dinner, for example. So kind of a, um, a uh, again an example of uh, interrogate uh, amnesia because it's uh, something you did recently it's it, it all those actions occurred after this surgery and those are the behaviors and memories that he, he had uh, most severe deficits with and now interestingly he showed evidence of implicit memory so if you remember from a couple slides ago that's that automatic memory the memory that does not does not require deliberate uh, and intention to um, to secure, to store. Uh, so for example, he did not remember uh, practicing a mirror tracing task, but performance improved over time. So the important part here is not necessarily the mirror task itself, but the fact that this is in a, a uh, kind of an implicit uh, memory task um, uh, as evidence, uh, well, that's, that's just what it is. Um, and uh, you can see in the uh, charts on the bottom of the screen that the, the, the amount of errors that uh, HM uh, uh, committed in each, uh, on each day uh, went down, thus suggesting that HM was building or was able to create certain kinds of memories, but not other kinds of memories. So going back to the previous example, an inability to remember what they had for dinner, but uh, ability to perform well on this on this um, mirror task, uh, which suggests that this mirror task and in, in other uh, tasks and other behaviors, uh, that there are different types of memory and um, which are, are um, dam uh, which suffer setbacks uh, depending on which parts of the brain are damaged. It, again, it was hypothesized to be the hipp hippocampus, but ne uh, now researchers suspect that's not exactly true. So let's talk about the neural correlates of uh, particular mem uh, types of memory. So implicit memory is mediated by the striatum. The explicit memory is largely located in the medial temporal lobe of the brain. An important point is that storage and retrieval of new information 
takes place in whichever area encoded or was activated by the information. Neuroimpairment allows researchers to identify regions of specialization. Implicit memory develops earlier in infancy than explicit memory. And explicit memory improves as hippocampus develops. So kind of our big takeaways here is that, uh, as I stated, the storage and retrieval of the new information takes place in the area that was encoded or was activated by that information. So particular memories um, being more implicated uh, in particular regions of the brain, depending on um, the uh, area of the brain that was activated during uh, that memory uh, storage and retrieval. Uh, and as I said before, in the previous slide with HM, the idea, especially in the prior to uh, advances and uh, neuroimaging technology, the best way to um, identify the regions of specialization within the brain was uh, to identify people with specific illnesses or specific injuries, uh, and then uh, test their ability on an array of tasks, and then kind of correlating their test scores to uh, uh, theorized uh, regions of the brain that are damaged. Implicit memory develops earlier, going back to this idea that's automatic, uh, less attention is needed, and this makes sense for an infant who has uh, fewer attentional resources and uh, a less, uh, uh, less ability to um, kind of just juggle with, you know, difficult uh, learning task than, you know, an older child. And the explicit memory improves as the hippocampus develops, again, kind of evidence that uh, memory and uh, particularly explicit memory here is, uh, is um, the hippocampus is involved in explicit memory. And finally, problem solving. The use of the information processing system to achieve a goal or arrive at a de uh, decision. The exec executive control processes guide the selection, organization, manipulation, and interpretation of the information uh, throughout the life, parallel processing, carrying out multiple cognitive activities simultaneously. So kind of just a basic definition of problem solving. And uh, the executive, kind of the, what we talked about before, kind of involved with um, interpreting information uh, that an individual is interacting with, uh, selecting what information to um, pay attention to, and organizing and manipulating that information. So let's begin with the uh, infant memory. And uncovering evidence of memory uh, is done through three methods, imitation, habituation, and operate conditioning techniques. Habituation, learning not to respond to a repeated stimulus. Ignoring your smoke detector beeping for weeks. Infants prefer to look at no, uh, novel stimuli. Upper conditioning, task taps into implicit or procedural memory. Young infants have difficult, uh, difficulty recalling what they have learned if cues are insufficient or different. Early memories are cue dependent and context specific. So habituation is um, kind of uh, dealing with uh, kind of what's stated in the first bullet point, learning not to respond to a repeated stimulus. Infants prefer to look at novel stimuli. So you keep presenting a particular item to his infant state, uh, face, and initially the infant will look at it, find it interesting, but over time, okay, I've seen your chapstick 900 times, I don't care anymore, I wanna look at something else. And in adults, uh, this is uh, one example is kind of just ignoring your smoke detector beeping for weeks. Um, it's no longer novel and you're able to ignore it. And operant conditioning. Task taps into implicit or procedural memory, as I stated. Uh, so, kind of the idea here is that uh, one what kind of one example is tying a child's uh, ankle or leg uh, to uh, I don't know a toy or in this case um, a uh, whatever that thing called is uh, the, the uh, kind of like a chandelier kind of thing that hangs among a child. And the child uh, learns that if they kick their leg, that the, their toy will move in a certain pattern, which is interesting. So kind of the idea here is that a child will remember to, through this uh, operant conditioning, that moving my leg means that my toy does a little, moves in a certain way that's uh, appealing to me. And finally, the you know important point is that uh, early memories are cue dependent and context specific. So the more so there, it's not just exactly kind of a flat 
uh, memory level for uh, infants, but rather uh, depend on cues and uh, depend on the context in which the memory is stored uh, and in which the um, the uh, action that is to be encoded, the memory uh, that is to be encoded, uh, occurs. Next, let's talk about imitation. Infants as young as six months display deferred imitation, which is the ability to in, uh, imitate a novel act after delay, which clearly requires memory ability. It seems to represent an early form of explicit or declarative memory. Children will over imitate. Children will copy irrelevant behaviors when they are alone, seen across cultures. The Kalahari San in the Australian uh, Aboriginals, for example, um, demonstrating its cross cultural. Um, uh, nature of over imitation. So what are we getting at here? So you can uh, basically do tasks where a experimenter does a, a collection of just stupid irrelevant things uh, before actually performing the task. So imagine opening um, a box and before opening the box I do a somersault and then I clap five times. And well if an infant watches me uh, do this um, after X amount of trials, uh, an infant will actually copy that exact sequence of behaviors before opening the box, even though it's really, they are not uh, inherently necessary to opening the box. And evidence for this exists because if you leave the room and, a bo and that box is present, uh, the infant will perform those behaviors, uh, that is, without um, the presence of uh, any adult. They will perform the behaviors to open that box. And again, this is seen uh, across cultures. And continuing on in this vein of problem solving, infants can overcome obstacles to achieve desired goals. Increasingly pay attention to the cues provided by adults. Increasingly solicit help by pointing, reaching, or letting the adult know that assistance is needed. Across uh, species, a study was performed comparing two-year-old uh, humans to chimpanzees. Uh, the, uh, they were divided into two groups. One group was shown a model using a rake teeth uh, side down to grab a desired object. The other group saw the model use the rake upside down. Children copy the model in both attentions. Chimps use the rakes with teeth down. Chimps don't care about the intention of the model. Okay, so what are we getting at here? Um, if you, as you, recall, you should recall from the previous slide, the humans over imitate. And one reason for this, it's theorized, is that culture is such an important part uh, in the transmission of information. Um, to uh, future generations. It's involved in what we talked about it also in the previous uh, chapter. This accumulation of knowledge over time is critical where culture is playing a key role in kind of natural selection. Um, so one uh, example of this in which I teach in my uh, cross-cultural psychology courses is uh, co comparing uh, different apes uh, species. In this case um, chimpanzees uh, and um, also orangutans, but I did not list them here in humans. And what they did is, as I stated, they put uh, the, uh, these uh, chimps, orangutans, and humans into two, one of two groups. Uh, one group used uh, a rake, uh, teeth side down, to reach a desired object. So for whatever, an ape, whatever it was, a banana or a fruit. For a child, it's, you know, name your favorite toy. It's a PlayStation 5, doesn't matter. Uh, and then the uh, other group uh, use, and, and sorry for that group, they use, as I stated, a teeth down position for the rake to kind of reach for that item, right? So they watch the uh, model uh, in one group use a rake with the teeth side down to reach for a desired object. Another group watches a model um, with the teeth uh, side up uh, position. And obviously, one of those are going to be uh, less uh, likely to able to reach uh, the desired ob object, thus making it less efficient and kind of like not, it's kind of common sense to do the opposite approach. The idea here was to look at which of the uh, apes, humans, chimpanzees, and orangutans, would copy the model's irrelevant behavior. Uh, would they, would they over, which of these apes would over intimidate? Uh, which of the apes we're most concerned with the intentions of the uh, demonstration. So uh, because again the culture is so important you would expect in humans that uh, you would expect that humans would copy 
uh, this irrelevant behavior, or in this case, counterproductive behavior, because it, a human naturally believes that, okay, uh, especially as an infant, that this, that this behavior is important to my culture, and therefore I'm going to copy this behavior. I care about the, these broader intentions that don't just center around, center around me reaching that fruit, that PS5, that banana. And what they found was that children copy the model on both conditions, and chimps use the rakes with teeth down. That is, the chimps uh, used the method that was most efficient in uh, gathering, grabbing that fruit. Uh, and children, on the other hand, uh, used the method shown by the experimenter regardless of its efficiency. Again, speaking to this natural inclination in uh, children to seek uh, a seek advice from their uh, elders but which is implicated in the fact that they're looking that we're a cultural species that we're ultra social species that's trying to determine the intentions of others and acquire a culture a sense of belonging within our larger larger cultural context there are four major hypotheses about why learning and memory improve in children changes in basic uh, capacities such as neurological development changes in memory strategies Learn effective strategies for putting information into long-term memory, increase knowledge about memory, know how long they need to study, how much effort, and increase knowledge about the world. Expertise makes material to be learned more familiar. Familiar material is easier to learn. So kind of we have four components. We're going to walk through some of them in detail, but kind of what we're looking at here is uh, neurological capacities, um, uh, um, uh, neurological development allowing for uh, increased uh, uh, memory, long-term memory, uh, increased efficiency when storing memory, and kind of uh, a, a better understanding of the strengths and weaknesses of an individual. What it is that you're good at, not good at, what requires you to pay more attention to and less attention to, and how to go about um, uh, learning something. And during and as you acquire more expertise throughout life, uh, it becomes easier to learn uh, new information because you become familiar with that information and you're able to relate this new information to previously uh, learned information. There is no consistent evidence that capacity changes across the lifespan. We could have more room for storage than we could use. Speed of mental processes improves with age. Myelination allows older children and adults to simultaneously perform more mental operations and working memory than younger children. Older children's mental processes become increasingly automatic, frees up cognitive energy for other novel challenging tasks. Neural studies indicate that with age, children go from using scattered and general neural activity to specialized area. So we've talked about this in previous chapters, but the idea here is that myelination allows for efficient, uh, kind of uh, less conscience, conscious and uh, less effortful uh, memory, or just, um, you know, kind of the processes in, in general. So this myelination uh, allows uh, children, due to its efficiency, its, its rapid speed, uh, its ability to communicate with multiple uh, neurological networks at the same time, uh, this allows older children and adults to uh, work on uh, more complex tasks and also simultaneously perform more tasks uh, at the same time in working memory. So kind of this increased ability of, of working memory being driven by myelination. Uh, and um, older adults' mental processes become increasingly automatic, as I stated, uh, kind of correlated with um, uh, myelination. And because more processes are automatic, you have kind of this cognitive, uh, free cognitive energy or a reduced cognitive load that allows you to focus your intention on things that you are less familiar with, on novel challenging tasks while the easier parts uh, are kind of just running, you know, in the background, uh, per se, you know, kind of more automatic, while younger children um, don't have that benefit, uh, A, because they're lacking uh, uh, similar levels of myelination, but also myelination is, is uh, you know, correlated with expertise and general knowledge of something, so kind of it's, um, these environments, interacting with the environment, driving uh, myelination. Uh, so, uh, which is, you know, driving expertise, which thus uh, creates uh, a neurological cap capabilities to um, uh, perform more challenging tasks by freeing up uh, cognitive energy. Now, interestingly, uh, 
infants uh, or I should say children increasingly uh, show a specialization uh, within uh, their neural activity when performing a task and younger children or uh, children who lack um, familiarity with particular tasks show a more generalized and even more, uh, neur more neural activity, kind of a generalized neural activity uh, compared to older children uh, with more uh, familiarity with a task. So it goes back to this idea that we've talked about kind of from day one in this class that just because you're spending or allocating more cognitive resources to something doesn't mean you're better at something. Rather, uh, it's, it's really these automatic, myelinated, fast, efficient processes interacting with each other within uh, uh, specialized networks uh, that um, are implicated in uh, increasingly uh, the inc decreasing ability of children to perform complex uh, cognitive tasks. Memory strategies. The likelihood of using a strategy to aid memory greater when motivated. Children remind you, I want candy. Younger children have a tendency to make preservation errors, which continue to use the same strategy that was successful in the past despite this strategy's current lack of success. Three and four year olds rarely use rehearsal, repeating the items they are trying to learn and remember. So let's uh, talk about this for a second. Uh, some of the big takeaways here is that uh, motivation plays a key part of memory. So if a child wants candy, they're not going to forget that you promised them uh, yesterday that uh, when you go to uh, Publix that you uh, uh, told them that they would get a piece of candy. They will remind you and they will do so repeatedly. Children tend to make preservation errors and this is, as you can see on the left here, this is a, a traditional uh, uh, task that tests the um, the amount, the frequency of a preservation errors within a child. So in this task, basically, you ask a child to play a memory game uh, where you tell the child to uh, put the uh, uh, red boat with the red bunny and the blue bunny with the blue boat. So you have them then sort this at, you know, at e either physically, so sometimes they're stuffed animals and sometimes you can do this digitally. Then the researcher will say, let's play some crazy wacky game. We're going to get wild, guys. Let's do it. And this time we're going to put the, um, you kind of have two options. You can put the blue bunny with the uh, red bunny or, you know, some researchers will say, no, we're going to put the blue bunny with the, with the red boat. So basically the idea here is you're changing the rules and uh, suddenly. And ch the younger you are, uh, the more likely you are to keep sorting by the original rule and thus make a preservation error. Three and four year olds rarely use rehearsal. So going back to a few slides ago, the idea here is that uh, memory improves with the under, uh, with uh, increased ability and knowledge of what types of memory strategies work well for remembering things. So rehearsal being one of them, so just kind of repeating yourself, repeating whatever something uh, out loud over and over again helps you remember something at least briefly. Uh, and children, the younger you are, the less likely you are to do this because it's not only that you uh, lack the neural capacity to do so, not only do you lack the expertise, but you also lack the ability to understand what uh, strategies are most, most useful for you to uh, encode and store and retrieve memories. And of course, as you re learn those strategies and you also uh, uh, interact with the world around you and become familiar with things, uh, this is reflected on a neurological level, leading to increased myelination and development of particular brain regions, and which we can see uh, when children, you know, either deprived children or neglected children who don't have the opportunities to uh, participate in learning new information or uh, new information or rehearsing memory to the same extent as other children. They suffer from uh, myelination deficits and um, other uh, neurological uh, deficits implicated in, um, or I should say developmental delays implicated in memory uh, development on a neurological level. Continuing on memory strategies and looking specifically at organization, which is classifying items into meaning meaningful groups one way you do this is through chunking, so you see this random array of, array of letters, and then chunking it into familiar acronyms, USA, NSU, WTF, LOL. Works with pi-digit memorization, can get digit span memory up to 79 digits. 
Elaboration. Actively creating meaningful links between items to be remembered. Helpful in learning foreign languages. Bear aid in Apple. Rehearsal emerges first, then organization, then elaboration. So kind of going back to chunking, kind of just uh, putting things into meaningful chunks uh, to an individual. And elaboration is kind of similar. You're making the information that you're learning meaningful. Again, kind of relating this, both of these, relating uh, this new information to previous information. And elaboration, you know, uh, there's examples of learning new information in a language and just talking it through and trying to develop these little narratives uh, which aid in you, which aid an individual uh, to memorize a uh, uh, either a vocab word or some kind of concept. So, I mean, an example of this would be, I mean, chunking. I mean, chunking is kind of straightforward, so it's not as useful, but chunking. So, if I said, oh, chunking, I, and I just love cookies or something, like, oh, ch ch chunking, uh, ch 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 chunky chocolate chips, chunky, uh, the, each piece of the chunk uh, uh, represents, some, is a meaningful piece of the cookie, therefore, uh, the, the, <laughs> rearranging letters into meaningful things is, is what chunky means. So basically the point is here is you're connecting, you're just kind of elaborating on this concept by tying it into whatever uh, that is useful to you and, and kind of creating this narrative or, or and uh, or not necessarily narrative, but you can use a narrative to create meaningful links between uh, the items uh, to be remembered. Children also um, uh, demonstrate an increased knowledge of memory, and we've talked about this in the beginning of this uh, 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 subsection. But let's give these some terms, and beginning with meta memory, which is a knowledge of memory in the processes of memory, knowing what your memory limits are, which memories and which memory strategies work for you, knowing when your memory strategy isn't working. Metacognition, knowledge of the human mind and of the range of cognitive processes, understanding you're better at math than art knowing that you can't work with Netflix on. Improved metacognition may be one mechanism of reducing preservation errors. Adults slow down to think after a rule shift. So this gets back to what I was saying before. It's not just these neurological processes just occurring on their own, and it's not just um, developing and interacting with the world to kind of um, uh, lead to synaptogenesis and pruning in memory areas. Uh, in the brain that are implicated in improved uh, memory, but also kind of this general sense of knowledge about yourself. So uh, kind of a knowledge of, in looking at metacognition, it's kind of this meta-knowledge of what you are, knowing what your limitations are um, uh, on a cognitive level. So kind of going back to the Netflix example, knowing that I can't study with TV on in the background, uh, understanding that you're better at one subject than another, and uh, what evidence for this is that when you perform, going back to that rabbit and boat example, one way to uh, reduce uh, preservation errors in adults is when they when they in uh, interact with an unfamiliar task, they know that I should operate slower because the quicker I operate, uh, the uh, more likely I am to perform poor, uh, poorly on this task. So again, it's kind of this knowledge, this meta-knowledge of your cognitive abilities uh, versus uh, meta-memory, kind of dealing with uh, knowing what your memory limits are, which memory strategies uh, work for you. So knowing that maybe flashcards work for you versus, I don't even know what other strategies are highlighting, which, spoiler, doesn't work. But so because it's just kind of this knowledge of memory uh, at this individual level and what works best for you. Increase, which leads to increases of performance on a wide variety of tasks. The knowledge base also uh, impacts memory. The knowledge of a content error to be learned is, our knowledge, is the definition of knowledge base for this class. It affects learning and memory performance. Expert chess children perform better than adults on location of chess pieces tasks, but are worse on digit memorization tasks. They were experts, so they had the capability to chunk chess pieces. So basically what we're getting at here is that individuals bring particular knowledge bases to a task and uh, they're, thus there typically isn't seen a kind of globalized um, deficit in memory. So for example, you know, kind of this classic stereotype that adults are, older adults are not good at uh, perform well on particular memory tasks, but if you have them complete a task wherein they can bring in their advanced knowledge base uh, to 
the uh, you know the arena of the task, uh, they perform much better on the task. So in the example of uh, chess um, uh, expert chess players, uh, they are able to perform better on uh, kind of chess like games, so spatial games, because they rely on similar strategies uh, that were developed uh, through working with uh, those types of tasks, those types of games uh, throughout their lives. And specifically in the chess example, kind of using chunking uh, to uh, perform well on that uh, task. And I just want to include kind of a quick uh, takeaway uh, set of messages about the development of learning and memory. Uh, older children are faster at memory tasks and can juggle more tasks. Older children know more about memory and know which strategies to use. Older children know more, which increases the knowledge base, which, oh sorry, I should say, increases no, increasing knowledge base allows for faster and more efficient processing of information and related domains of knowledge. So it's, they know more, they, they have better strategies of memory, they understand themselves more, they're developing, uh, they have increases in myelination, a greater specialization that allows them, a neural specialization that allows them to perform better on tasks. And they just also know more, um, thus bringing more knowledge to a particular task, which then frees up cognitive resources uh, to focus on the hard parts of a task, while simpler parts of the task that they're familiar with occur on a more kind of unconscious automatic uh, level. Autobiographical memories are episodic, specific memories of personal events that are important for understanding of, for, of who we are. So kind of straightforward autobiography is who we are. But then the question is, why do our autobiographies, our autobiographical memory, and our memories more generally of events uh, during early childhood disappear? Um, few autobiographical memories of events uh, that occurred during the first few, uh, for first few years of life are remembered. One theorized reason is working memory. Infants and toddlers may not have enough space in working memory, which is needed to hold multiple pieces of information needed to encode and consolidate memories. Their social cultural support with mother-child conversations about past events increasing memory may be rehearsal effects. Neurogenesis. The birth of new cells in the hippocampus replaces older cells and possibly older memories. So these are three competing theories. Um, with three kind of all straightforward, with working memory being that because working memory is reduced or lower, I should say, uh, in um, younger children, uh, they have kind of a less capacity to encode and consolidate memories, thus making many of their memories uh, disappear because they're never encoded and consolidated in the first place. There's also a sociocultural support uh, evidence. Uh, so when mothers and toddlers have conversations about particular uh, days of particular events, it does increase, there's evidence that increases uh, childhood memory. And other kind of neurological uh, uh, neuroscientists argue that the birth of new cells uh, brain cells through neurogenesis uh, actually ends up decreasing and creating a ch uh, decreasing memory and creating childhood am uh, amnesia uh, because uh, the new cells are replacing older cells and thus uh, children lose their memory uh, when these uh, older uh, brain cells are replaced with new brain cells. Another theory is the fuzzy trace theory. This theory argues that children store verbatim and general accounts of an event separately. Verbatim inf information is unstable and likely to be forgotten. Better to remember the gist of the event, the general points of this lecture. As children get older, they increasingly use just fuzzy trace memories. So kind of the idea here is that children are trying to learn or are trying to remember everything, like the exact sequence of things, these verbatim, the, the you know, kind of trying to use that AI model of downloading and uploading uh, the exact uh, sequence of events rather than understanding the gist of the general understanding uh, of what occurred that day. So in, for this class, if you, uh, instead of, if you were a young child, you may have been obsessively thinking about my chocolate chip cookie, poor analogy, um, rather than kind of the general gist of this uh, lecture at this point, which is that uh, neurological um, improvements and behavioral um, uh, improvements uh, contributing to increased uh, levels of memory across the lifespan. Another theorized uh, reason for uh, poor performance uh, on uh, memory tasks is a rule assessment approach. Memories are vital to problem-solving skills. 
determines what information about a problem children take in and what rules they have uh, they, that they then formulate to account for the information. Children problem solving attempts are not hit or miss but are governed by rules. Assumes children fail to solve problems because they fail to encode the critical aspects of the problem and are guided by faulty rules. Most children use multiple rules or problem solving strategies. So what this uh, argument or what this approach is arguing is that children do not just uh, blindly try particular things, but um, are trying things based on sets of rules that they have, no matter how flawed they are. And their inability to encode uh, critical, critical aspects of the problems uh, uh, contributes to uh, outdated or useless rules um, that, uh, that, again, contributes to their poor performance on task. And evidence for this uh, that these researchers argue is that most children use multiple uh, sets of rules and problem solving strategies. And thus, memories are vital to problem solving skills. And as children are able to kind of update their rules, um, they are better able to perform well on memory related tasks. And our final theory uh, for uh, childhood is uh, overlapping waves theories. Problem solving improves as we test out strategies, keeping the successful ones and dropping the poor ones. It's not a stage process, but like waves. So remember the stage theorists having individual uh, at each stage having new sets of cognitive abilities. But here we have a wave process uh, with multiple strategies being tried. Um, but over time, children become increasingly selective with experience about which strategy they use. They change or add strategies as needed, and they get better at using known strategies. Strategies evolve from acquisition in a particular context to generalization to other contexts. So we have a series of waves, a series of different uh, problem-solving uh, techniques that we use, and as we get better at, at um, using these uh, pro um, problem-solving techniques, um, and uh, we gain more knowledge about the world, we're able to change and add to, uh, various problem solving techniques and get better at the problem solving techniques that we already know, which leads to uh, just better performance on a host of you know, memory tasks or just problem solving tasks in general. And strategies evolve from kind of a specific context uh, when you learn something and you're like, okay, this only applies in you know, whatever this, this one particular setting to more of a generalized uh, approach to problem solving. Uh, where you, you're able to generalize your problem solving in one context to all contexts. As children reach adolescence, their elaboration is mastered. They develop and refine advanced learning and memory strategies. They make more deliberate use of strategies that younger children, that, uh, younger children do unconsciously and remember less irrelevant details compared to younger children. So kind of the idea here is that I a, uh, um, an adolescent is able to select uh, particular strategies based on their experience and uh, based on kind of their expertise in, gra in, in um, growing metacognition uh, that uh, allows them to perform uh, better on the task but also perform uh, quicker on the task. So it's not kind of just uh, inability to learn rules or even if it's not rule-based but kind of just this haphazard approach but rather children are able to think more scientifically and uh, approach uh, problem solving more deliberately and thus they perform uh, better on task and often or typically perform uh, quicker to come to the correct solution on the task. They also remember less irrelevant details so this is going back to children kind of trying to remember everything and not really being able to hone in on the key uh, informa uh, information uh, necessary, necessary to uh, either solve, uh, problem solve or uh, information that an individual feels will be useful in the future to them. And as I stated, adolescents perform content operation faster than children's do, can process more chunks of information and process information more quickly have greater functional use of their working memory, lower performance on working memory tests associated with higher impulsivity. So as I said before, children are, or adolescents are not just um, yeah, able to deliberate uh, and choose the most appropriate strategy, but do so uh, far quicker. And again, the evidence for that is implicated in, um, at a neurological level, uh, increased myelination and increased uh, coordination among uh, neurological uh, networks uh, implicated in problem solving. And uh, lower performance is associated with higher impulsivity and higher impulsivity kind of being traditionally correlated with aspects or part regions of the brain of networks, uh, neural networks that uh, deal with memory, such as the central executive, for example.
Meta memory and metacognition uh, continues to improve throughout adolescence. Adolescents are better at adjusting their learning strategies to different purposes and better at judging which tasks would be hard or easy. Training metacognitive skills improves learning. Adolescent girls report using more metacognitive strategies than boys in um, one study. Students from higher classes, aka have more wealth, report more use of metacognitive strategies. Some reasons are that um, more resources at home, uh, adults and parents and caregivers talk more explicitly about learning strategies, and they're able to uh, just hire more tutors to train particular skills due to their uh, uh, financial uh, resources. So what we're getting at here is, um, as I stated, the meta memory metacognition improves, um, and this is uh, related to the fact that you know implicated in these uh, two concepts is that individuals continue to learn and better understand uh, their strengths and weaknesses and how to go about addressing those strengths and weaknesses, what strategies to use uh, when studying, uh, how to study, um, uh, what uh, fields that they are uh, most proficient in, which uh, fields they struggle in. And as stated, uh, wealthier uh, children um, or children from wealthier homes and higher classes uh, report more use of cognitive, uh, metacognitive strategies, and this could be a whole host of reasons, but just more resources at home, more opportunities to interact uh, with uh, educational materials, or more involvement uh, or within these particular skill sets in parents who are not distracted by uh, you know having to work multiple jobs or stressed out by their neighborhoods or their life. Uh, could be more. They could be more impact, uh, affected by certain macro systems um, from Brown and Brenner, for example. So economics, politics. Uh, so a poor family being uh, possibly more impacted by uh, losing your unemployment insurance uh, during COVID, for example, uh, creating uh, either depression in in a household or just kind of distraction and uh, less really kind of energy to uh, help a child develop uh, meta uh, cognitive strategies as well as you know, just being able to hire uh, tutors, for example. Now moving on to adults' uh, memory and beginning with expertise. Adults perform best cognitively in domains in which they have achieved expertise. They rely on domain-specific knowledge and domain-specific information processing strategies for proficiency. Not only know more, but thinks more effectively and efficiently. It allows experts to hold and manipulate more information in short-term memory than non-experts. They require less effort so this is very similar to what we just talked about with adolescents, but um, to a larger extent with uh, adults who become experts, uh, who uh, know not only uh, know more, but are more effective and efficient uh, learners. And particularly on tasks that um, a measure that well are within kind of the realm of their expertise, they're able to perform well in comparable levels to adolescent adults. That is comparing older adults to adolescents. So older adults who have expertise in particular areas do not see those drop-offs that we traditionally in, in you know kind of stereotypes about uh, older adults' memory um, abilities. Uh, those gaps are either very low or a non-existence when uh, comparing uh, areas of expertise. And that's because uh, expertise relies more on domain-specific knowledge rather than this domain general. So kind of this global uh, uh, domain, uh, uh, global neural uh, process by which to handle information. Expertise is more of a specific context, uh, and that is context-specific and knowledge-specific uh, sets of information that allows an expert to perform effectively and efficiently on a task. And because they're an expert, and one of the reasons why this occurs is um, that uh, expertise allows them to kind of, again, free up that cognitive energy, reduce that cognitive load, because uh, so much of that, uh, some of, so much of the uh, task is now automatic for um, an expert, which opens up uh, more uh room kind of you know th theoretically speaking in the short-term memory and working memory allowing them to juggle uh, multiple pieces of uh, new information um, um, compared to non-experts so it just kind of requires them less effort and uh, you know less uh, cognitive energy to perform well on areas of within areas of expertise what determines uh, when uh, what event is likely to be recalled personal significance 
Rated significance at the time that event occurs does not predict memory, broader perspective on events may change memory outcomes. Distinctiveness, common events are lumped together as one. Emotional intensity, high negative or positive events are, are remembered more. And life phase of the event, remember more from 20s than any other time, related to how much time we spend trying to decipher meaning of events and the amount of life events that occurs in your 20s. So it's not, again, there's not this kind of global um, memory decline uh, with age, but rather uh, depends. Was that uh, event uh, personally uh, significant to you? Was it very important? If it wasn't important, then you know, you're less likely to remember it. Uh, if it's not distinct, that is like, oh, well, remember that one day I was driving to work or I, or I walked to the store? You know, if you walk to the store, drive to work every single day, and nothing really happens interesting, it kind of all just gets lumped in together. Um, in contrast, in uh, memories that are uh, have higher high intensity, high emotional intensity, you're more likely to remember it. And typically, uh, adults remember more from their 20s, and this can be for a lot of reasons. The 20s are typically associated with, um, especially in a Western context, but kind of cross-cultural evidence of um, this emerging adulthood where you're trying to figure out where you belong in society um, or who you are, you know, depending on if you're more individualized culture. Um, thus, you're spending more time, putting more cognitive resources, which, you know, by default, you're going to kind of um, uh, consolidate those memories uh, kind of through repetition, through repetition by thinking about it constantly. So what you're constantly thinking, constantly evaluating, analy micro-analyzing every detail of your life, you're probably more likely to remember those life events. Plus, the 20s is traditionally seen as an event where many uh, significant events occur. Uh, marriage, children, obviously that's been pushed back. So maybe we could see a life phase event occurring more likely to remember in the 30s than the 20s in the future. And that this could just be a kind of a generation or a cohort effect. Memory and aging. Most elderly adults report at least minor difficulties remembering things. Older adults learn new material more slowly. Most research is cross-sectional, maybe due to various cohort effects. Declines are not noticeable until the 70s. Not all older people experience difficulties, and not all kinds of memory tasks cause older people difficulty. So all, although uh, most elderly adults report at least some minor difficulties, uh, there are some caveats to consider. Uh, most research is cross-sectional, so there may be cohort effects that are implicated uh, in these uh, findings. So maybe increased schooling or increased uh, physical activity and cognitive activity from increased schooling throughout life may uh, contribute uh, to less memory declines in future cohorts. Declines are not noticeable in two seminars, as I stated, and not all um, older adults experience difficulties and definitely not across all tasks. Uh, again, kind of it's more of this uh, task-specific um, uh, memory, uh, poor memory performance, and we're going to get into a little more detail on why uh, in the next slide. So older adults perform uh, wor worse when the material to be learned is unfamiliar or meaningless. Better recognition of faces from their cohort than faces outside their cohort. Any, uh, any deficiency on tasks requiring recall memory than on tasks requiring only recognition can perform very well 90% in one study on recognition tasks, but performance drops on free recall tasks when only the when only the only cue is a photo of a classmate. Have more trouble with explicit memory tasks. Retain good semantic memory, but show steady declines in episodic memory. Recall or specific events with specific dates slash times. So kind of going back, this is a similar theme that uh, older adults are uh, better at learning new information when, when, when it's meaningful and what is familiar to them. So for example, um, or even real relevant to them. So for example, uh, they're able to recognize faces of their cohort. So if, you, so if you're able to, put, able to put up uh, photos in front of an older adult and say, okay, who is this person, who is this person? And then you did a kind of a similar task with people that they aren't familiar with. So some cultural, some TikTokers or whatever, and ask them, okay, and then read them the, the name of the TikToker and, and then ask them to remember the name 10 minutes ago, they would perform worse on that task because they're just unfamiliar with these people, with this culture, and probably uh, they find it meaningless and they don't g give a shit about these TikTok people. They also uh, perform better on uh, recognition tasks than a recall tasks, as I stated, uh, but 
they also perform uh, well on certain types of, of uh, recall tasks and specific types of memory. So for explicit memory tasks, where uh, general knowledge, a task that uh, measure general knowledge, that uh, semantic memory, uh, they retain, uh, they perform quite well on it and comparable to younger adults. But in episodic memory, that is remembering specific times and dates that something happened to them, uh, they tend to perform uh, worse than uh, younger uh, adults. So to exp uh, uh, expand on uh, those cohort effects that I talked about, some researchers argue that it's not a universal biological decline in learning and memory. Older adults are less educated, further away from schooling, and typically have lower IQs, which is correlated with ed education. Older adults uh, have highly educated, often perform as well as younger adults. Older adults more likely to have chronic or degenerative diseases, which impair memory performance. Older adults more likely to be less active reduces memory. Older adults who are physically and mentally active have more blood flow to the hippocampus. So kind of the idea here is that this is not a universal, necessarily a universal decline, but rather particularly cohort effects. Uh, wherein today uh, more individuals are graduating from college or, or just even attending primary school than you know 100 years ago. So comparing uh, or, or kind of trying to draw a universal conclusion based on particular cohorts um, may not be accurate. Uh, and we know that uh, just uh, one year of schooling um, impacts uh, IQ scores uh, pretty significantly. And we've, we've, we found that across, we, uh, researchers have found that across uh, cultures. And not only do they have left schooling, but they're further away from schooling, aka they're further away from um, interacting with these abstract concepts, these memory tasks, while, at, while uh, emerging adults, even if they're not necessarily in a bachelor's degree program or in college at all, uh, are at least closer to kind of their high school experience, uh, wherein they were, more, wherein they were uh, more likely to uh, partake in these uh, type of problem solving skills. And also, you have to consider that uh, adults also have older adults are more likely to have uh, chronic illnesses or degenerative diseases, and be taking uh, drugs, which uh, are implicated in impaired memory performance. Also, we find uh, research, also supports, research research supports that uh, higher um, mental uh, mental activity or cognitive activities and exercise is implicated in um, memory outcomes. So specifically, uh, some fMRI studies have found that increased uh, exercise is associated with uh, neural activity in the hipp hippocampus and specifically blood flow to the hippocampus. And finally, selective optimization with compensation, SOC, Younger adults generate more possible solutions to problems than older adults. Solutions generated by older adults tend to be more goal-focused and selective, quality over quantity. Models uh, how older adults may cope with and compensate for their diminishing cognitive resources through selection, focus on limited sets of goals and skills needed to achieve them, optimization, which practice skills to keep them sharp, and compensation, develop ways around their need for skills. So older adults uh, tend to uh, uh, provide um, uh, less or fewer solutions when kind of being asked to generate solutions, but their solutions are, are typically uh, more goal focused and uh, thus re reflecting kind of this quality over quantity approach to life. Uh, they have specific sets of goals uh, and skills that they need to maintain, and those are the skills and goals that they uh, work to achieve. And they do so by practicing those skills through so through optimization, and they are able to identify some of their weaknesses and then compensate it. They compensate for those weaknesses is uh, through alternative problem-solving uh, approaches. That is all for this week. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, have a great week, and I will see you uh, next week. Thanks a lot. Bye.